I remember during the first performance, uh, I was backstage and we've got music, dance, um, you know, and one of the songs, um, I can't remember which one, and I heard the audience tapping along to the music and even singing along with the words. And uh, I just felt a real connection. And, you know, th because this was also alien to me, I just, at that moment, realised, understood, you know, the, the, the power of, uh, of live drama. It was just fantastic. I think the whole thing, in a way, is about decisions, about when, about people find themselves are we going to do go this way when they're called upon either to do something or not do something and on which side of things they're going to stand and how they're going to approach that and how far they will throw themselves into it and what are going to be the results and I think all of those things were those questions were in that moment My name's Peter King. I'm from originally the outskirts of Liverpool. Probably not a genuine scouser, as most people understand it. But from a Liverpool Irish background, uh, my parents, grandparents, all lived in the Kirkdale uh, district of Liverpool. And our background is, is certainly steeped in, in Irish roots, as so many Liverpool families are. My name's Steve Nolan. Um, I'm Liverpool Irish too, but I'm from Heighton, actually. My parents lived in uh, a bit of an Irish uh, Catholic enclave. It might have even called it a ghetto on the south end of Liverpool because the main Irish area was the north end. But it was the same area that Jim Larkin came from. That's the Jim Larkin who statues in O'Connell Street in Dublin. Um, they were from there, they moved out of, to Heighton just before the war. And I met Peter through uh, through um, the collaboration in writing the play, actually. With pikes we fought against the cannon's roar. With pauper and priest align, we face Britannia's might. A light weakened across crimson fields of Vinegar Hill, reflected in the eyes of Aaron's youthful cause. Until our newly rendered colours rose once more. Liverpool Lambs is about a little known story of how around 50 men and women, all from Liverpool, who traveled to Dublin and took part in one of the most significant events in Irish history, an armed insurrection during April, 1916, which became known as the Easter Rising. Although some of those who took part were from Ireland, many were Liverpool born of Irish descent. The story follows the exploits from training sessions in Liverpool to receiving orders to travel to Dublin and finally the events during the Rising itself. The reason I got involved in writing the play was because three of my grandfather's brothers, my great uncles, John, Patrick and George, were members of the Liverpool contingent who took part in the Rising. They gave us but a glimpse of their gilded knives and tables laden with fruits of noble toil and expected gratitude for their scattered crumbs. The poverty of the mind and soul casts a shadow long to fade over those left to gently lift and carry dreams of Push it out! Push! Go in my shop! Clay! 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 Dust! Clay! Oh, no, she'll have a whole while, yeah. Oh, no, she'll People often ask me, why did your grandfather's brothers uh, in the middle of the First World War decide to fight for Ireland? 
why weren't, weren't they in the British Army? And I think to answer that question, you've got to understand, you know, obviously, the history of Ireland and uh, and also the history of Liverpool. Uh, Liverpool, I think, was very different in terms of, you know, such a large proportion of the population were, um, you know, first and second generation Irish. And they had a, a, a huge influence on, on the, the history and development of, of the city. Uh, my own family, uh, the roots are in County Wexford. And uh, the, inf the greatest influence over my, my grandfather and his brothers, there were actually five brothers in total, the three elders who were involved in, in the, the uprising. Um, th the main influence was that my great-grandmother, Murray King, uh, maiden name was Murphy, again from Wexford, and she was um, a very strong character. And I think it was through her um, family connections um her beliefs that instilled you know that the sense of history uh, and the importance of irish history in her sons so i think when when the time came that they actually joined um a group called the irish republican brotherhood um before the first world war um obviously there was, there was a lot going on but politically to try and um, push the Home Rule Bill through Parliament. Well, the connections run right back to 1798, didn't they? Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the Murphys, the, 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 there's a, two very famous um, Murphys. There were two Catholic priests, both called Murphy. Um, one of them, there's a song called Boule of Ogue, which many people will know. That was uh, named after one of the priests who actually fought in a, the 1798 uh, rebellion. And there was another Murphy, another Father Murphy, and... I was told that he was related, uh, you know, in the same line as my great grandmother, and I think that's where she got that that fierce sort of Fenian uh, ideal and uh, and brought it with her. You know, do you remember these people were were living in a country that was, you know, when they first came to this country was alien to them. For many people, the, English wouldn't be the first language, certainly from the west of Ireland and many other parts of Ireland. They, they came to Liverpool and they brought their history, their culture, their language with them. And, uh, and, and that's the influence, you know, that my grandfather's brother brothers came under. Um, I'm very envious of that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> because my family was just left, but kicked up through the famine, came to Liverpool, lived in the slums, worked on the docks, went away to sea. Never got involved with that stuff, unfortunately. No. But my great grandfather only um, didn't speak English. Spoke Irish as a first language. He did learn to speak English once he'd got here. Um, but he couldn't read and write, and he couldn't, and, he, and his first language was Irish. But uh, that lineage of yours, I'm, I'm very, I'm impressed by that piece, and I'm envious. And and remember, you know, many people, you know, came to this country. Um, it wasn't their choice you know they were forced to due to the circumstances um and it must have been very difficult to them and i think there's lots of parallels you know with with, with what's happening today um you know with sort of people migrating into this country now you know it, people the irish in those days must have gone through very similar um you know been in very similar circumstances well 19 and yeah and, and 1916 was an historic event wasn't it? it was a historic rupture and, it, and it, in fact what it ended up with was the first country that had broken away well apart unless you count the the american colonies um from the british empire defied the british empire and they gained independent independence from it um but your family were involved in all those things that it was eight eight hundred years of being occupied by uh, britain and incorporated into it and then rebellions repeatedly over over that time, terrible events like um, the famine, or more accurately, some people would say a genocide. Um, and then in 1916, it all comes to comes to a head when some people, and I think the play shows this as well, doesn't it? They were a minority, even in Dublin. They represented a minority in the country. But it's always a minority who will take those kind of actions whatever the general feeling is. But um, they were vilified at the time of the rise by a lot of people in the city. Because, as you said, 1916, it's the middle of the First World War. 
And thousands and thousands of Irishmen are in the British Army with their families left behind in France and Belgium. And um, and then, then there's this rebellion. A lot of people, in fact, we put this into play, didn't we? Um, it is recorded that a lot of the women whose husbands were away who collected their army money from the post office were outraged when the post office was occupied and life stopped for, for, for a while in the city. And we're hailing abuse at the people who did it because it all changed within a couple of weeks when the leaders of the rising then were um, summarily executed. And I think that changed everything. That's right. And following the rising... Um... All of the Liverpool contingents actually survived. And uh, my granddad's brothers um, all spent the rest of their lives in, in Ireland. My grandfather, Thomas King, was the only um, one of the five brothers. Um, the fourth brother, uh, Edward, or he was known as Ned, he followed the, the, the three eldest over and fought in the War of Independence or took part in the War of Independence. But my grandfather, Tom, was, was the only one who actually stayed in Liverpool, which is why there's a branch of the Kings in in Liverpool and and uh, still, you know, many relatives back over in Ireland. The Rising itself, of course, didn't achieve independence on its own. It was a stepping stone, though. It was it a was stepping a, stone. I think it was a huge, uh, a huge step in the right direction. And a whole war had to be fought <laughs> subsequent to that before it happened. Go away, woman, you'll be killed. You'll be you killed. Get out of here. Well, I want to see my husband anyway. Get out of here. Crazy. Well, when the telephone patrol is out a few pounds or some postage stamps at least, I need to feed me child. Look, Maggie, he says, get out of here before you get destroyed. Can't you see? There's dead tummies all over the place. I'm not a few of her own sorts. Well, will you at least tell me, is he going to his work in the morning? Oh, for God's sake. Hey. I first met Steve back in 2014. 15. 2014. Was it? It was October the 7th. The reason I know that was because it's my wife's birthday. Oh, grand. And I was invited to the inaugural meeting of what was called the Liverpool Easter 1916 Commemoration Committee. It was a bit of a mouthful. And um, I was invited to take part in this committee because of my family's background. My Some of my relatives were actually involved in the Easter Rising back in 1916. And the committee had all kinds of plans to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the Rising in 2016. Uh, we had exhibitions, uh, lectures, um, all kinds of different events. And we sat around a committee table and that was the first time I met Steve. Steve offered to run a, a drama group that we'd considered devising and me being on this committee i was thinking everyone's got involved with some kind of uh, job to do what am i going to do so steve volunteered to lead on the drama production i've had no background no experience whatsoever in that area but i said he's an evertonian that was a good thing yeah that was a plus i'll get involved with steve so i basically agreed to help steve in a drama production a yet as yet unnamed but well, my memory is slightly different because I didn't go to that first, that very first meeting of the committee. I found I was a bit slow getting into that. I heard about it after you did. I think you'd already been to one or a couple of meetings. But the thing that attracted me, when I found out about it, I saw, I thought, well, that's an interesting thing to get involved in. I've always been interested in, um, I've always been around Irish politics and the whole thing. Um, and then saw that as part of the, the, uh, the events they were planning, already for 2016 they said a drama production well that was you know that i'm i'm a drama person i was an actor for more than 10 years i worked in um, then i did i was a drama teacher for a while and i thought oh great well I'm, I'm not sure what they want but i could probably contribute something to that and then i went to a meeting and there was pete sitting there and then it, it became obvious during that meeting and pete was related the people who'd taken part in the Easter Rising in 1916. And he'd already had a go at writing something that would be a scene of a play that um, told the story of his uncles and the participation of people in Liverpool in the Rising. 
So that kind of was the thing that started it. But neither of us were really given the job straight away of coming up with a play. It was kind of there. He'd had some ideas, and I said, well, I might be able to help with it. And that's kind of as far as it went at that time. Because the initial talk was all about, well, we don't know how much funding we're going to get, and if it's a load of money, we'll get a professional writer in, and we'll get professional actors, and we'll do this, that, and the other. So it was all aiming high at the beginning. It was a while before we realised, well, if the drama part's going to happen, it will be me and him doing it. And then when we realised that there was very little funding, uh, we did apply for a lottery grant, if I remember. Um, we did get some funding, but it was quite limited. And we realised that, as Steve said, we'd have to do most of the work ourselves. Um, I'd written a history of my family about 20 years ago. Uh, the reason I wrote it was because when I was young, we because I came from a large family, Family get-togethers always involved, a game of cards, a few drinks. And my grandparents are telling us stories. And all I can remember were those stories about his brothers fighting during the First World War, but not for the British Army. They were fighting against them. And I couldn't work this out when I was a kid. They were actually fighting for Ireland. And... I'd kept those stories with me for years. So about 20 years ago, I got the chance to write it all down. And then it was an academic kind of essay type task, but I had the story in my head. So when the commemorations came along, it just seemed natural to get involved. And when I started writing, Steve said, why don't you write a few words? I put a scene together and it flowed. All these stories that came out from when I was a kid just flowed. It's something, it was brand new to me. I'd probably not done any creative writing since I was at school. And it stemmed from there. Yeah, the um, the, the whole 2016, the 100-year the anniversary, the centenary of the, of the rising, it was, um, we didn't get a whole mountain of money, but it was something that was promoted by the Irish government for the Irish diaspora in England, Scotland, and in other countries. So there were funds available from them. And I think in the end, that was where most of the money that we did get came from. We were supposed by the Irish government or the British government via the Arts Council. <laughs> we weren't really interested. Well, they offered us nothing, basically. But it was supported from the from, uh, from, from Ireland. And um, that was enough. To, there were enough we knew to, to get us started on, on the thing. And Peter's family story obviously was fascinating i'd never come across anyone whose family had been involved in the rise and i was well, i was well excited by it. i thought there's some real possibilities here so the first time um we got together we got some uh, a group a local group together from the sort of amateur dramatic scene obviously like Steve. oh well can i say before that we did eventually but of course as, it, as the ambitions went from, well, get it all professionally done, there'll be loads of money and everything, as those um, as those levels of expectation necessarily came down. We did initially, because I went around personally, we went around local drama, we went to Lippe, we, we put adverts out, we did, and let's try to see if we can get some students, actors in, let's just treat, we'll draw people in from anywhere if they're interested. Let's get the best talent we can. And we drew a blank in most of those places. Uh, and so we did eventually... And I think it was better in the end. We gathered people in from the local the local Liverpool Irish community. That was who formed the, uh, the core of the thing in the end. Uh, like we were, well, we were, we were the people creating it and the people who acted in it were the same. Um, so actually it worked out really well for that. But we, yeah, we, we, we couldn't, we didn't get the people we envisaged at first, but it wasn't total amateurs we were coming up against, uh, uh, drawing in. Um, you know, there's a thriving um, theatre scene in Liverpool, and those people are, they might not be professional actors, but they're very experienced. Some of those, some people who'd never acted before, well, Peter's daughter, he'll tell you about that, she was in it, she was brilliant, and she hadn't actually been been on the stage before. Um, so it was a combination of all these different people and different talents coming together. And we'd had a brief right at the beginning. The brief we were given from it, because somebody had thought about it before we even got involved, said, well, we want to tell the story, um, and we want to involve all the um, all the cultural things that are available locally and through the Irish Centre. So Irish music, Irish musicians, dancers. And I was thinking, 
oh, we've got to want some we don't want a mute you don't want seven brides for seven Irish brothers do you want a, a musical here because that, that I wouldn't be interested in putting that on but that again that was um that was a challenge and also how do we create something really good truthful artistic and include those elements in a way that that that, that makes them meaningful as well I do remember the first session though when we got the, the, the group of actors together and we did a read through of the first scene and I actually read my grandfather. My grandfather was the youngest of five brothers um, and he wasn't involved, he was too young in 1916 but he, we did include him in the play and I wrote, uh, I spoke the words of my grandfather during the first session with all these some very experienced actors and uh, to say I was apprehensive was an understatement. And we read through it and uh, the reaction was fantastic. They said it sounded natural, positive. It was, it was for me, you know, who'd not done anything like this before, it was incredible uh, to get that feedback. Yeah. Oh, well, that's made me feel a bit emotional, that bit, thinking about <laughs> that. And you're right, I remember that really well. Um, but it was only that scene at that point, wasn't it? It was. And a few ideas for the rest of it. Um, so I thought, well, there's two big jobs here we need to do. We need to really get some proper research done. So we're really telling, not just the story of your uncles, but putting it into a context. And making sure that we're being accurate about that. And uh, and also, we've got to create something that this has got to be a proper drama. You know, the opposite of what some kind of musical, you know, in quotes, happy musical uh, would have been. Um. And so one of the first things I seen to me, I remember this being really early on because you'd only written that piece was we 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 came up with some dates. I said, okay, we'll do these as um, I called them um, devising sessions, and said to the people, look, we want you to create the play with us here. And Peter will write it, or we'll write it with you. At that stage, I think it was you were thinking, well, you write up what's done. I'll get people together. I'll organise some um, improvising, some some devising sessions. And people, we got a core of people who were really willing to do it. And then it really began to take off. And they were brilliant, weren't they? And actually, hardly any of them ended up as the actors in the play. The people who really began to create it in the beginning. And then, um, I don't know, I, I think I set it up fairly well because we got some exciting stuff out of it. Do you remember when, when Moira was doing it and, and Declan and people there who had no clue about acting yeah, we... and they didn't want to be in the play? But you give them some scenes to act out, like your... your um, your grandfather and those people uh, in Liverpool, and then and they just they just ran with it. And of course, when we done those sessions, Peter was able to go and say, "Okay, I'll, I'll write I'll write a scene from what we just created." Yeah. But I, I do, do um, think we should uh, mention uh, St Michael's as it was then, St Michael's Irish Centre, because the whole project was based there. Uh, it's now just called uh, simply the Liverpool Irish Centre, but they gave us great support. Uh, we all the rehearsals, all the preparation was done there, and I think without without the um, the Irish Centre and the local Irish community, uh, you know, we would have really struggled. Oh, they provided the the amenities. We didn't pay for that. That's they? right. Something. Yeah, that was yeah. Could none of it would have happened without the Irish Centre, none of it at all. And in fact, all the people in those early days I'm talking about, they came through either being part of the Irish Centre or people who knew people and knew people and so on. And, um, yeah, they, they, they were key to the whole thing. So the writing developed. We started rehearsals in September 2015. And by then we booked uh, the first performance for March 2016, um, pretty close to the 100th anniversary of the Rising itself. So the pressure was on them. We had a group of people. We'd, we'd written several scenes. Um, but yeah, because it had to be done, didn't it? it yeah, this we, was we, a commission. It was like, this is a commission. Okay, it's a 100-year anniversary, so you can't spend two years writing it, and it's got to be done by then. So, so yeah, the pressure was on, wasn't yeah. it? Really? And at one stage, I was just one scene ahead of the, the rehearsals, thinking, I've got to get this done for the next rehearsal. And we, we got it all finished by January 2016. Um, so we booked Liverpool Irish Centre, St Michael's as it was, and we also booked the Unity Theatre in Hope Street in Liverpool, and we met the artistic director there. Uh, basically, we booked booked the theatre for a night, and we sold out 
um, we could have filled it twice over. Um, obviously, we didn't know how the reaction would be, you know, how it would be received. Um, but it was a tremendous occasion, particularly that the opening night in March. Um, I think I was so apprehensive. And um, before the performance, uh, we'd only sold 70 tickets. And I was thinking, there's a, this is in a hall of 150 people maximum. And on the night itself, just before the curtain rose, <clears throat> The place was absolutely heaving. People turned up, paid on the night. We had to open extra rooms, put extra chairs out. It was literally standing. Panic room. stations, they were, they were queuing around the block. Yeah, it, we, I think we delayed uh, the start of the play because yeah. there were so many people trying to get in who just turned up at the last minute, paid on the door. In fact, my wife, Fanola, who turned up to watch, uh, ended up selling tickets on the door, putting seats out, the extra seats out, and the atmosphere. I remember it was a warm night as well. The atmosphere was incredible. And I was backstage doing stage management, setting props, and uh, the tension, the, 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 the atmosphere was fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's that, that might sound a bit like, well, we started off, we wrote the play, we put it on, it was a big success. It was a, it was a long, rocky road between starting it and putting it on. I think that's fair to say. I think you're right. I haven't counted how many rewrites there was. I mean, personally, by what, at one stage, we'd done those initial uh, uh, improvisations and, and, and devising, really, it was in a way. But um, then Peter had written some, then he then he went away and just wrote some, and we came back and tried that. Um, but it, it kept having to be redone. And I'll tell you what happened in the end, because originally I was I'm thinking, well, I'll have to direct it and said, yeah, the whole thing. You're going to write it. We'll get actors to do it. But then it, it got to a stage where <laughs> we were the consistent figures through the whole thing. We eventually got a consistent cast together, but it wasn't until around Christmas, I don't think. I yeah, we've been going a couple of months. I think it was in January, I think. Steve, it was even in January. Yeah. So Peter and I would, would go to his house. It was usually your house, wasn't it? <laughs> and we do the improvising and devising between us. Because he'd say, well, I can't see how, I can't see how this scene's going to work where... Uh, they're gonna. We've got. We've got to. We've got to somehow deal with the volunteers. Um, get into the the occupy the GPO in Dublin. That's the central event. That's where the things happen in the centre of the play. How are we gonna do it? And I was saying to him, and he's going, "Oh, I can't envisage it because you because as you said, you didn't have that much experience with creating theatre or drama at that time." And I'm saying, "Look, I can't tell you. We just have to do it. Look, Pete." <laughs> We were moving stuff around in his front room, and I said, "You've got to improvise this with me, and I'll show you how it's going to work." <laughs> and it, it was a wondrous process because actually, I really enjoyed them sessions. It worked a treat, yeah. didn't it? I mean, I, I eventually I didn't understand at first that you didn't need lavish sets and props all over the place. Yeah. And the main uh, props were were simple stage blocks. I think we used about eight stage blocks, and the actors moved them around between scenes, and uh, it just worked. And this is the stuff that that Steve. Uh, explained and, and and taught me um, that you know they let the audience use their imagination. You don't have to have you know, you know detailed props and and uh, you know items on stage. That, you know let the let the imagine uh, the audience imagine those things. Um, eventually, you know, I, it, it, the penny dropped with me, uh, and it did. I said it's it just worked. It's it worked so well. I mean, we did use some props. I actually made some of the props myself. Um, we, we had some replica Lee Enfield rifles. Um, we had uh, there's a scene where the the uh, volunteers made uh, bombs out of uh, old cans, old uh, cans. condensed milk cans, <laughs> stuff like that. Um, so I, you know, I, I got I got these things together. You know, I really enjoyed that to be honest, um, and that was that was part of my contribution. Um, yeah, don't get all shook about that because he made some brilliant stuff for it, actually. And oh, yeah. We, and we wouldn't have got it any other way, I don't think, because we couldn't afford, we wouldn't have been able to afford to pay anyone to make them. He made some brilliant stuff. But I was always going to kind of say to him, it doesn't have to be that detailed. That does. That's an important thing. That That's an important. It's not just, don't think of them as props. These have to be things that are advanced, a part, are central to the action, to what's going on in the play. Because um, I hate all that set dressing and things that you see some productions do um, 
you know, and you say, what's all that? What's that all there for? Ours was minimal. This was minimal. But it had really key things, and Peter was brilliant at producing them as well. Yeah, another thing I think that was that was authentic about the play was that um, obviously we created the, the dialogue, um, but all the events in the play were based on actual events, and some of the dialogue were words that were actually spoken at the time, and that yeah, was do, yeah. down to the research. I mean, Steve did quite a lot, and I think we should mention Kevin McNamara, or Dr. Kevin McNamara, who uh, helped Steve in particular with the research. He he actually chaired the uh, the commemoration committee. Uh, sadly, he's no longer with us. But you know, he was a central figure in former he, Labour MP. He was former Labour MP. Shadow for Secretary Hull. for Northern Ireland. Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. He was shadow for, um, for many years, and I think he also had, um, you know, with his backing behind us. I think it lent some weight to what we were doing. And, and actually, on the opening night of the play, he actually addressed the audience and, and talked about the background, you know, the political yeah. uh, background, and put it into perspective for the audience. Um, but we did as much as possible, um, you know, use all the events were, were as they happened. Um, you know, obviously the, the dialogue we used. Yeah, and, we, we, Sorry, and the language, we tried to make the language of the day um, to make it as, oh, as real we were as forever possible. crossing out modernisms, weren't we? That's right. <laughs> we yeah. wouldn't have, didn't speak like that in those days. But Kevin was also a historian, wasn't he? That was his, that was his academic expertise. He was a historian. And I spent a whole day with him and to his house in Formby. He lived in Formby. And uh, I went round there and he just spent the whole day going through all this stuff. And, and, he, and he actually came up with lots of real incidents that happened, which we made part of the action of the play as well. Uh, and, but, and, I did, and I think that research was important because um, we had to weave a story around it, but we had the basis of a story. We knew what had happened to his, his relatives um, and we knew generally the events. Generally, but we did. We, I mean, I went over to Ireland twice. I went to Dublin twice. I did the, um, I did the tour. They did um, a 1916 Easter Rising tour around the city. Did that with the tour guides and everything. Went to the museum and saw the things that were going to walked, pasted out from uh, Liberty Hall, which is where the Liverpool Volunteers uh, went to on the day of the Rising, and then marched around with James Connolly into uh, Sackville Street, as it was then, and to the GPO. I paced it out. So that when we were writing it, I thought, well, I know how this works. It's it's round the corner. And obviously, we condensed it. But I knew that I knew the things were in relation to each other, as well as the things in time, how they happened in relation to each other. Well, I knew them as much as you could do with that, with that amount of research. And then, um, yeah, Kevin was, Kevin was brilliant. Kevin was instrumental in all that. Um, and he led that, he led that committee really well because he had all the contacts as well. He did from his from his days as an MP. <laughs> but there, there were things, yeah. There were, he snapped his fingers and we got them. That's right. Um, another thing I think we should mention is is the uh, the title of the play. The play is called Liverpool Lambs, and people say, "Well, where did that title come from?" Um, the title. It's not what you wanted to call it. Was it? No, it was actually it was a very democratic decision. It wasn't my first choice. Um, but the, the title came from, um, it was a quote from um, one of the leaders in the rising was Joseph Plunkett, um, all the contingent from Liverpool, men and women. Um, and uh, not the women, just the men. Oh, sorry, you, you're right there, Steve. The, the the men from, mainly from Liverpool, Liverpool had the biggest, biggest contingent. There were also men from London and Glasgow and, and some from Manchester. Yeah. Um, they were all based before the rising, once they left Liverpool, they were based in a place called Kimmage, and it was the home of Count Plunkett. He was a papal count. Uh, he was the father of Joseph Plunkett, who was one of the, the leaders of the Rising. And uh, this motley crew of Scousers turned up, and uh, Joseph's sister, Geraldine, saw them and christened them My Liverpool Lambs. And, and that's where we got the title from. Yeah. Yeah, you put that very well, Peter. That's where it came from. I mean, I, I would, I, you would never come up with a name like that for it. She actually called him a Liverpool lamb. She must have been very fond of him. And then in, the, in one of the books on the Kimmage, the book on the Kimmage garrison, it talks about the day they, on the day of the rising when they set off, she sort of waved goodbye to her Liverpool, in her words, to her Liverpool lamb as well. But I thought it was, a, it just seemed right. It just felt right as a title because um, it's got so many meanings contained in it, hasn't it? 
um, well, during the First World War, you've got the lambs to the slaughter sort yeah. of connotation. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it was, it was a strong, strong title. Yeah. And to our leaders of fame and renown, assemble the German against the might of the crown, brave Pierce and Connolly together did go. And they set up headquarters. In every generation, the Irish people have asserted their right to national freedom and sovereignty. Six times during the past 600 years, they have asserted it in arms. Standing on that fundamental right and asserting it again in arms in the face of the world, we hereby proclaim the Irish public as a sovereign, independent state. And we pledge our lives and the lives of our comrades in arms to the cause of its freedom, of its welfare, and of its exaltation among the nations. The Irish Republic is entitled to, and hereby claims, the allegiance of every Irish man and Irish woman. And the battle raged on to the dark east of day. As the rest of the world looked on in amaze, the Angelus bell did mournfully peal, as our bold volunteers made proud Albion We, we declare the rights of the people of Ireland to the ownership of Ireland and to the unfettered control of Irish destinies to be sovereign and indefeasible. The long usurpation of that right by a foreign people and government has not extinguished the right, nor can it be extinguished except by the destruction of the Irish people. We ended the play um, at the surrender, uh, at the uh, evacuation of the GPO and surrender. Obviously, so much more happened following that event. Um, the volunteers from Liverpool uh, and many others were interned and eventually ended up in a place in, in Wales called Frongok. It was an ex-German um, prisoner of war camp uh, and they, they emptied the German soldiers out and ended up putting about 1,200 um, of the, the rebels from the, the Easter Rising. And they were there from, I think, around May... 1916 up until December and the three King brothers were amongst those who were in turn there and many years later um, there's now uh, or there was a, a stone a monument to remember um, that interment and I was fortunate enough to be to be asked to unveil the, the monument it was about 15 years ago now and, and that project was led by a guy called Tony Bertil, who's very well known in the, amongst the Liverpool Irish communion, uh, community. He's a journalist, he's a, uh, a teacher, and he also teaches uh, Irish, the Irish language uh, in the Irish Centre. And he was the one who encouraged me way back when I started writing about the history of the King family. It was his course uh, that I followed in, in Irish studies that... Uh, that triggered me that that started the whole process uh, of learning stuff that uh, you know even going back to the days when i was a kid i just didn't realize the extent to which they were involved and how, how they were wrapped up in the uh, the history of ireland just because your ancestor was a famous fighting priest doesn't mean our sons should be doing the same thing shouldn't they be joining the british army like everybody else. <laughs> They'd be safer and fancy than in this bloody kitchen if they did. If I ever saw one of my sons wearing a British uniform. I've had enough of this song. You're saying you wouldn't support your own sons. Support them? Jesus, I wouldn't even feed them if they wore that khaki. Press a eye! Press! Come in, watch you up! Come in! Come in! Come in, go outside! Sorry! Press! I'm in the house, kids! 
Well, and we'd always hoped. Um, it was a big success. It was more successful than we thought it would be. We were very pleased with what we'd done. And we always hoped that um, there would be a possibility. That wouldn't be the end of it. There would be an afterlife for it. Um, but, you know, it had, there was certain, there were a lot of special conditions that brought it together. Uh, the first hint that it might go on was uh, when Emma Smith from the Liverpool Irish Festival, who came to see it originally, mentioned um, that she might have some connections that might help us to get the play published. And, of course, that would be for a way, a way for it to go on. It would then be available for anyone who heard of it or, or read it to take it up. Um, and we tried a few things also. We thought we, we, we went to um, Ireland at one point because there were people in Wexford who were inter- still are interested. But it didn't really start to get moving again until... Uh, Peter went to see a play about um, a Liverpool character called Kitty Wilkinson. Kitty Wilkinson, done by a um, local theatre company called Falling Doors. So I met uh, Emma Smith in 2018, actually at a production called Kitty, um, about Kitty Wilkinson. Um, it's a play by Carol McGinn, and it was put on at the Medical Institution um, as part of the Liverpool Irish Festival. And we talked about the future for the Liverpool Lambs and the, the attempt to try and, and get it published. But Emma, once she'd, she said she would um, approach some publishers, um, but the feedback from that was that um, they would prefer to publish you know, on the back of a, uh, a tour or a revamped uh, a version of the play. Basically. Yeah, a new, a new production. Um, now, obviously, the, all the, the, the effort, the time, the logistics of putting it together in the way we did with a cast of over 30 back in 2016 was probably not going to happen anyway. So, so you know, we were delighted when um, it was suggested that a group called Falling Doors um, would, would take the play on board. And, uh, and that's what happened. That's, that's the, the future development lay, lies in their hands. We gave Sarah and Nancy from Falling Doors a copy of the script and they actually loved it they gave us fantastic feedback and were happy to take take the play on and um produce their interpretation of it so the the plan was we, we, which were made up by of course incidentally because they've got a really good reputation for them does and you know without the support and without them taking it forward you know the play would probably be sitting on a shelf somewhere you know, but we think it's important that, that you know, the story is told, uh, you know, on a wider basis. So the plan was to to uh, include uh, the Liverpool Lambs as part of this year's 2020s Liverpool Irish Festival. But should unfortunately... Been, yeah, should have been coming up soon, October. Yeah, October 2020, but unfortunately because of the pandemic, um, that's um, been put on hold till 2021. So the plan now is to is to put on um, the play next year again as part of the Liverpool Irish Festival 2021. <laughs> So Steve and I uh, got a huge, uh, I think, emotional attachment, and certainly in my family are literally steeped in the history of of, of the the play and the, the events around which it's based, and it's. To give the hand to the play over to you know a group like Falling Doors, um, we are a little bit uh, not uncertain, but you know we'd like we'd like to see what they can do with it. And I know that um, they're, 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 I think they're inspired, hopefully inspired by uh, the script they've read. And uh, I think we've got to put our trust in in their interpretation. They they will look at it from a different viewpoint. Um, and it'd be interesting for us to find out, um, you know, how they adapt it, and, and hopefully yeah. it will be a, 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 a huge success. Yeah, but it's a piece of art, isn't it? I think we have created a piece of art, and once you've created a piece of art, it's out there for other people, isn't it? We didn't write it just for ourselves in the first place. And, you know, you give birth to the baby. If it's, if, you know, if it's going to go any further, the baby, unless you do it yourself again, and I think that would be a big task. Um, 
Yeah, you hand it over to somebody else to do. I mean, <laughs> Shakespeare can't say whether people should do his play or not. Imagine if he saw some of the productions of it, he'd probably be appalled. But uh, I have no fears with Fallen Doors at this point because uh, we've met him, we've got to know them a little bit. And um, I'm sure it's in really good hands. And, um, yeah, we've got huge investments in it. And they've, they've said to us, well, yeah, you know, um, we, you know, we might we, we might invite you in on rehearsals or when we're making certain decisions and so on, and that's a lovely offer, and I'm 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 ready to take it up, but I, I would hope that would be minimal. You know, it's not we're not it's not the play of 2016 we're doing, or the production of 2016. It's the new production, but I think the play stands up, and I think if anyone was to ruin it, I don't think they will, but I think if anyone was to ruin it, they'd have to work hard on it. <laughs> Again, from a personal point of view, uh, I'm just happy that um, the memory, you know, of, of not just my family, but you know, all those people from over a hundred years ago, their their memory will be be carried on. You know, they they were the heroes. Um, I think it was a very brave thing that they did, and uh, you know, we're very, more than happy for um, Ford Indoors to take take it forward. There's so many people who gave up the time. Um, yeah, some people we just press ganged. There was a member in the second performance, the second set of performances. Um, that one of the parents turned up to drop a daughter off, and he ended up playing Thornton's role. It's a character called Thornton in the play. Do you remember? Oh, yeah, he, I said to him, "Do you want to be in it?" He just he just <laughs> literally turned up to drop his daughter off. He said, and he'd never been on a stage before. He'd never done any acting. And he ended up on the second in, in the October of 2016 when we did the, um, as part of the Liverpool Irish Festival, we um, we put two performances on again back at St Michael's. And, uh, you know, some, some people were committed to other things. So we, we, we changed we're quite a few of the, 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 uh, the cast for the second set of performances. So we put another call out, you know, with the, the guy who turned up to drop his daughter off. We press gang people into it, but everyone did it willingly. Nobody got paid. Everybody gave up the time freely. We have mentioned Don. And the guy who did the... Because uh, we realised we're going to have to... We need some sound and stuff here. Or, or it's going to... Dis- I suppose you could have done it without In fact, we didn't have some of the things that like some of the lights failed and things. But um, I got with some, we need a stage manager. We need someone who knows what they're doing with this stuff. And... Um, I'm just some, oh, yeah, somebody let us down. We won't go into that. But at the last minute, I met Forsley. See, I knew, I really good, he's probably my best mate. He lives in Wolverhampton. Yeah, I knew him through from our theatre days. Uh, he's a lecturer now in Wolverhampton University. But he said, yeah, I'll come down and do it. And he just, he sorted everything with the lights, the sound. Me and him spent a, a day and we made all the sound effects there. There were um, all the gunfire and all the rest of it. Everything slides, we did a slideshow for the beginning. But he did it for nothing. He did it just because he was mate and he loved doing it. And he hadn't been a stage manager for a long time. He said, Oh yeah, I'll come and do it. And he and he couldn't be there at the unit. He just threw us into into a flap. Because when you're relying, like you said, if people are being paid on a contract, you know when they're gonna be there. <laughs> and he, he he said, Oh no, I can't do that. He was doing something else. So you know, we got around that one. But he contributed so much, didn't he, Tom? Oh, he and did. He was incredible. And he was brilliant because when I was having trouble because we'd worked with them so long by that point, keeping the cats in line, herding the cat, <laughs> he said, it's all right, because when we were doing dress rehearsals in the last couple of years, I'll just do my stage manager bit, which is what I'm supposed to do. I'll take over. <laughs> and he was going, get there and do this. Do that. I was like, go for that. Because by that time, I was in it as well. We are trying to direct it, get it on and off stage at the same time. He was able to do all the all the state, all the um, yeah, everything else, as well as all the technical. He was the crew and the stage manager at the same time. 
I also drafted uh, my daughter in, Sorsha, who was, um, she'd done a little bit of drama in school, but had never really been on a stage. And she turned up every week uh, for rehearsals, never complained. And uh, she was absolutely fantastic on the night. So, I mean, I'm just so grateful, um, you know, to her and everybody else who took part. She na fi na fa a ta fi ka de hen We are still a chin her on fring chol A foy fair slay shant near o shin shin a faster Ni ha for fring chir a the Liverpool Lambs Listening Party has been brought to you by Falling Doors Theatre. If you've enjoyed the podcast and you'd like to donate to our production next year as part of the Liverpool Irish Festival, please follow the link to our PayPal. Any donations will be gratefully received and will go towards the production costs to bring this show to new audiences. We'd like to thank everyone involved in the making of this podcast, including the Liverpool Irish Festival and the original cast and crew of Liverpool Lambs 